Hallelujah. Come on, let's continue to worship Him for a moment. Let's worship. Lord, I love you. Come on, take the moment. Take this moment and just worship the Lord. Lord, I love you. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you all glory and honor. I worship you. You are my King, my Savior. Hallelujah. My provider, my healer. Hallelujah, Lord. You're my Savior in everything. I give you glory and honor and praise. I worship you. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord Jesus. I worship you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I love you, Lord Jesus. I give you all glory, honor, and praise. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. What an amazing Savior we serve. Amen. What an amazing Savior. I'm so thankful today to have all of you here, but I am of all. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm so thankful that we have the Lord not just in this place, but in our lives. Amen. Amen. He's not just here to uh, tickle our fancy, if you will, for a few moments. But if you if you come in this place and you feel the power of God, and you leave with that same power, the power of Pentecost, woo, it'll change your whole life. It'll make every, everything different, everything better. Everything better. It'll, and I mean this, it'll make everything better. Amen. I am so thankful today. I, have, I am going to be a little emotional today. Uh, I want to say I appreciate my wife. She's, man, she's an amazing singer. And uh, glad I have my my first grandson, my, my fourth grandbaby, but my first grandson here today. He's in his first church service. Amen. And uh, he's, he's not able to understand what I'm saying yet, but I pray in Jesus' name one day he is filled with the Spirit and uh, living a holy and righteous life and able to stand before God with uh, strength and honor and humility, of course, always humility. I uh, appreciate all of you. I've got a, you know what, I'm going to just say this. Let's just do this for a minute. Have a seat. I want to say um, a couple of quick uh, things. Today, uh, 21 years ago on Pentecost Sunday, we started Victory Church. And that was an accident. We didn't know it was Pentecost Sunday until Pentecost Sunday was there. And we're like, oh, it's today, huh? And uh, so it was not intentional, but oh, what a what a occasion to start a Pentecostal church <laughs> on Pentecost Sunday. And, uh, but I want to honor um, my wife. I don't know where she went. Did she disappear back there or is she somewhere else? Yeah, I'll wait a minute. I'll just mumble along until she shows up in a minute. I'm just playing. There she is. I want to I honor my wife. Um, I got a few things I just... Where is this Kate here? Is Kate here? Kate's in the nursery. There she is. I heard her this morning. She's the saint of the month, by the way. We had that a few years ago. Uh, Caleb Coppinger won the saint of the month. I'm just kidding. Uh, it was a joke then. It's a joke now, but I just want to honor uh, this mother of 17 girls. And uh, just kidding. She's only got three. But uh, I know there's, they probably act like three. But I heard her this morning. She's like, I... It's, she was working with somebody about doing something, and I don't know what it was here in the church. And she said, well, look, I've got Sunday school, then I'm taking care of the nursery, and then after church, I'm meeting with the youth committee. And then I talked to her during church, and she's going to be going to uh, a matron and youth camp. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, on top of having a husband like hers and, uh, and, and three daughters, I've just, Sister Kate, how long have you been at church here? So, yeah, you're, I, yeah, and uh, my, it's just such an honor to have her. Sister Hilly, um, 2000, fall of 2001, and summer almost. It was like August or so, and uh, July. July. My goodness. So, anyway, I just want to say um, that victory wouldn't be victory without people like this. The Myers, uh, the, the, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble, so I'm going to be very... I don't know who, who else? I don't know of anybody else. I'm just kidding, Sister Crenshaw. Like, ah! Look at me. 
Just kidding. No, <laughs> I can't forget such a great job. So many of you. And uh, I just honor you. I'm thankful for you. Um, my wife and children, especially. Um, Caleb, I mean, excuse me, uh, Cameron. No, I'm sorry. Hang on. Give me a second. <laughs> Baby, help me out. My mind blank. Cason uh, Beckham. Cason Beckham. Maybe one day you'll watch this video, Cason. I love you. He was our first and only non-family member at our first church service. And uh, Kaysen, I don't know where you're at. Hope you're watching today. Uh, I honor you. And you made, you gave me hope that, yeah, maybe there's possibility. <laughs> what I was feeling was right, that God was calling me to College Station. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit, and I'm going to get into the, I'm, I'm going to preach. Just bear with me for a few moments. I've got to uh, say a few things. I want to go back a few years prior to Victory Church and just say that I'm so humbled and honored to pastor uh, my wife and children, of course, as I said, but uh, I'm, I'm my uncle's pastor. And uh, what a weird and unexpected turn of events has gotten us here. Um, I remember just being transparent, so I'm not going to say anything that any of our children would like. You need to cover your ears, child. Uh, I, I do have some things that I could say that would embarrass all of us, but I, I remember uh, walking out about 2 o'clock in the morning um, on, a, on a corner in downtown Houston and saying, I, who do I call? And I called my uncle, and um, they, he and my wife come down there and pick me up and said, let's, let's start life anew. And uh, prior to that moment in my life, I was, uh, I was headed for a very bad spot, very bad place. And I don't know that I would have survived physically. And I know I wouldn't have survived spiritually, but I probably wouldn't have survived physically. <clears throat> and uh, I, got a, I, got, I could apologize to a lot of people that I tried to kill. <laughs> That's kind of funny, but not really. <laughs> and uh, people that I have abused and been so mean to. And, and uh, I know you don't see it, but I was full of the devil. I'm telling you, 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 you see people in your life that you don't know. Man, why are they acting so stupid? Man, they're so uncontrolled, un, un, uh, um, whatever. You know, they're, they're untethered to society, untethered from reality. And I'm telling you now that Satan can... Uh, Get a hold of you, and you can you can do some of the most dumb. Amen. I don't even know the words, but God, but God, and and I am so thankful. I was talking to Brother Jackson before service. It's just to me, out of the billions of people in the world, that God would reach down and and kind of just just. I, I, th I can use that man. I can use that woman. I can, and and if they would just give me an opportunity, and that person turn their heart and their mind and say, you know, I want to be used. I'm, I'm available. I, I'm, I'm nothing in myself. And I think that's one of the things that, that we need to recognize. And, and unfortunately, with suits and ties and nice cars and nice houses, it doesn't bide well with this attitude. But that's something that we need to come to. I'm nothing without the Lord. I'm nothing without the Lord. And, and, and I can't make it without you, Lord. And so... Uh, it just, something has to break inside of us. And I'm not talking about, it doesn't, I'm, we talk about pride as if it's something that just a few have. But I'm telling you, <laughs> oh Lord have mercy, God help us. We all have it and uh, we all need to kill it. So I want to, I just want to, again, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but I want to say thank you to my wife, uh, two kids, and uh, uh, I'm going to just say kind of a devil-possessed husband. <laughs> so that really, and I mean that. It, 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 I, I'd be pretty close. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm thankful that my wife just said, Lord, she, now I want, to, I want another little lesson, and I'm going to preach. Just bear with me. You need to learn some things. Some of your kids and grandkids are acting so foolish. You do not need to pray, God, protect them. God, bless them. God, help them. God, do whatever it takes that in this mess that they're creating, they come out of it and start living for you. Amen. And uh, thank God for a wife that prayed, Lord, whatever it takes. 
And uh, lastly, I want to just say thank you. Not last. Well, yeah, lastly, before I get started, but thank you to my aunt and uncle. I don't even have the words. First, I think the, the morning after I got to their house, I don't remember what day it was. It was like a, probably a Friday or Saturday, if I remember correctly. I was sitting at the um, at their table and I was talking about, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay you back. And my aunt walked up to me, that one over there. She walked up to me and kind of said, yes, you will. <laughs> oh, oh, what a what an amazing, amazing uh, blessing. Acts 19, let's go there. For those of our guests here, uh, I am so thankful for you. Uh, I've been pastoring for 21 years. Sometimes I feel like it's been just a few weeks, and uh, I, I haven't learned a thing. Other times I feel like it's been forever, and we're just thankful that all of you are here. For those of you that are struggling, you're going through things in your mind, your heart, and things in your life and you don't know how to handle it, uh, don't do what I did. <laughs> Run out in the world and, and uh, just be foolish. But humble yourself. Uh, save yourself a lot of heartache, a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of pain. Save your family some, some true anguish by just saying, Lord, I'm here. Uh, help me. Yeah. And uh, when you pray that, God will help you. I, I did not know, and I know it sounds a lot of weird for me coming over the pulpit. I'm going to get to Acts 19, but I did not know what I needed. But when a chaplain come by and says, anybody want to speak to the chaplain? And I said, I said, I need a Bible. That's all I knew. I didn't, I didn't, I knew this guy didn't know the truth because I was raised in, I was raised in, in an apostolic church. And I knew the truth. Jesus is the Lord. I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I knew, I knew I need to live a holy life. I knew that. Jesus is God. And there was just, well, there's one God. And he manifests himself in many ways. I knew those things. Well, I didn't need to hear these, you know, mealy-mouthed Trinitarians telling me about, you know, the Lord, these three of them sitting on, and it's like, I, don't, I know the word enough to know. I know what I know. Right. And um, so he come up, and he didn't have a Bible, and uh, I was aggravated. But he gave me the book of John. And when I, got, when I opened the book, I read book of John chapter 1, and I got down to verse 14, and I was, I was laying on the ground, an uh, older black guy was sitting beside me, and uh, he was—he had murdered somebody with a brick. And uh, he—I'm sorry for telling y'all all this stuff. You need to know <laughs> um, there is hope. And uh, I got to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. And man, when I got to that point, my heart broke. My my. My, the fountains of the deep of my soul un, opened up and I began to pray and cry and repent and repent. And I started crying. That old man says, son, it's going to be all right. What's wrong with you? Your wife leaving you? And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I couldn't explain it. Amen. But God's so good at that very moment. I felt the, the purging of all my sins, of all the dumb things that I'd done, totally washed away. And God began to work on me. And I'm telling you today, if you're here today, and you don't know what step next. We're going to get into it. Acts 19. Let me hurry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For those, ah, God help me. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. Ephesus, if you look on the map, here's Turkey. It's on the far uh, west side, west coast of Turkey. Now, there he found some disciples. Now, this word disciples uh, is Greek. It's methes. Methets, um, and it means a pupil or a student. He found some disciples, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Um, this is, this is uh, interesting to me, because there are a lot of disciples of Jesus in the world. Now, I'm reading out of the uh, e, um, English Standard Version. I was going to read another one, and she didn't have it, and our notes didn't jive. So I'm, I'm, if you see a scripture up here in another format than what I'm reading, your Bible probably says the same thing. There are disciples. Uh, there are students. Some versions use the word students. Some, use, some versions use believers. There are some versions out there. But the word, the original Greek, is methets, and it means a student or a pupil or a learner. And he said, did you, read, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Lord, I pray that you would help us. Dear God, that you would stir up the hearts and the minds of every one of us, Lord God, especially me. 
Lord, you've carried me and brought me so far, but I know you're not through. And I pray that you would continue to work, Lord God, where, where you started and that I would continue to surrender, Lord God. Pray that you would move in every heart, mind, and soul here and that those that would be uh, inquisitive or, or interested, Lord God, in the truth of your word, I pray that they would be motivated to not just hear and to be interested, but Lord, that they would change. I give you glory and honor for everything. We give you praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, 35 years. So I'm going to give you a quickly going to this. 35 years after the grand opening of the church. <laughs> Uh, 35 years after the, what we call the day of Pentecost. We're called a Pentecostal church because we take our lineage, we take our heritage back to the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost was, uh, it was already a holiday. It was already a day that was celebrated 50 days after uh, the Passover. And here we are on the day of Pentecost 2,000 plus years ago. And they're celebrating, they're having a feast. But it just so ha I say just so happened, there is no coincidences with God, but God planned all of that day to have a, uh, a big audience. Some of us think that, oh, a small church, a big church, none of that matters. Let me tell you something. The Lord wants many people to hear the message of truth. That's why I, I know we're not a, a growth-minded church. We're a missions-minded church. But we've got to realize that it's not about me and my little people. It's about the world. Right. Amen. You're being filled with the Spirit, you having a Bible, you had just having a Bible is about you ministering to the world. And so uh, on the day of Pentecost, God coordinated it all together and said, on the day of Pentecost, I'm going to pour my Spirit out. And that's where we read in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, uh, on the day of Pentecost. And the power of God was poured out. So <clears throat> there were still people that uh, 35 years after that day, of Pentecost, there was still Pentecost flowing, if you will. Uh, and I, I, I say that it's probably not the right term, but it, there was still the power of God flowing, pouring out that Pentecostal experience. And so Paul is astounded that there was still people 35, I want you to do the math here, 35 years after Pentecost, there is a group of uh, pupils, students of the word, students of Jesus, uh, learning of him possibly, growing in him possibly, but they were not fully fulfilling the word of God. They didn't know some things. And so Paul sees them, these disciples, these followers of Jesus, they, maybe they think, just think a few things, like maybe they recognized his Messiahship. Maybe they knew him as a great teacher or a miracle worker, but, but uh, not, they didn't know, this is the deal, and this is where some of us are, they didn't know all the benefits of knowing Jesus. Like, 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 mean, like having an, it's, it would be like having a, and, and I use this example, <laughs> an unlimited, uh, uh, you don't even have to pay the bill at Sam's. You just go in, grab what you want, walk out. You don't even have to pay. Unlimited membership. And, and when you get this, when you, by the way, I didn't know this until a year or two ago. I was out there getting gas at Sam's and they come up on the screen and said, you know, buy your car through us. And I'm like, whoa, you know, you can buy a car through Sam's, save you some money or something. I don't know. Or, it, it's, or a country club with an unlimited, you don't have to, have to pay anything. All you got to do is join. Wait a second. How do I join? Well, it's going to cost you a lot. But in, in the kingdom of God, it's not like that. They didn't really, not only did that, they not know what they could have, but they did not know the value of what they could have. They didn't realize it's not just you can go in, but you can get anything you want. And those things are not like little trinkets, but they're massive, valuable things that can be a great blessing to your life. So I read about a lady recently. In fact, this, was, this week I read about a lady that had bought a... Um, couch off Craigslist. Somebody, you probably read it, it was on the news all over the place. She bought a couch off Craigslist and, and uh, somebody, one of her family members or something, sat on it and felt like they had something under it. And they unzipped the cushion. There was $36,000. And uh, yeah, it was like, whoa, I bought a, I mean, oh wait, buy, I take that back. She didn't even buy it. It was free. It was free. She got it free off Craigslist. But uh, I, I read another 
story. This is a few, well, well, a while back, and it was just always astounding to me. And this, you, there's stories all over the internet about this stuff. Uh, a lady bought a, or excuse me, she inherited, she inherited a painting from her grandmother when her grandmother died. She hung it over her bed. She was like a 19-year-old student. This is back in the 80s sometime and didn't think anything of it. And one day she realized there was a mosquito under it, under the glass. And so she pulled the thing apart, was pulling it. And she realized this is real, you know, stuff. The painting is not a print. So she took it to a appraiser and they said, ah, oh, it's just a print, $250, $200. That was in like 81. Then in 04, she said, you know, this thing has got to be worth more than just $200. So she took it to another appraiser and they said $250. She held on to it until 2018 and she come to find out it was a rare painting that was worth over $350,000. And it just hung there, but she didn't realize the value. Now, of course, thankfully, she didn't go and sell it when she was her 19 self because <laughs> you would have got a lot less but, but that, is, that is the way some, some things in life are there's so much value I, I look at value in, in relationships value in, in your marriage value in, and oftentimes unfortunately you don't know what you have until you lose it you think so you know I, well, I, you know, I won't get rid of this and get rid of that and I'm going to get this and get that and, oh dear God but we, should, we should ask ourselves we should ask ourselves, what's the value of Jesus Christ in our lives without his supernatural work in our lives? What is the value of having Jesus in our lives like a, a student, like, like my second grade teacher, Ms. Layton? What's the value of having Ms. Layton in my, in my life anymore if I don't have something supernatural about Jesus? Let me tell you something. There is a value to Jesus that goes far beyond just knowing his name. That goes far beyond just knowing about him or understanding what he can do and has done. There is a value in the name of Jesus that, can, that surpasses everything else. And it's not just in the name but in the spirit. So what's the value of the church? If there is no spirit, what's the value of a supernatural relationship if, if, it's, it's, if it's not with Jesus Christ? What's, what's the value of living for God if you've not truly been born again? Uh, 1 Corinthians, I read it last week, 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 says, If in this life only I have hope in Jesus, then I'm of all men most miserable. The ERV says, and I didn't read it exactly right, but in the ERV it says, If our hope in Christ is only for this life here on earth, then people should feel more sorry for us than anyone else. But I am so thankful that you don't have to feel sorry for me. You don't have to pity me. You don't have to pity the church. You don't have to look down on me. Oh, yes, I have the power of a Savior that is in heaven. Woo! One that can do anything, anything. Don't pity me. Don't pity what I've done or what I, quote, unquote, have to sacrifice or have to give up or come to live for God. Man, I'm telling you, the best life is the life living for the Lord. The best life is the life filled with his spirit. We have, we have more hope in the power of the spirit of God than in anything else in this world. Tell, you give me the best heart doctor, the best lawyer, the, uh, the best health coach, life coach. I, none of them compare to the Spirit of God working in me. It changes my mind, my heart, my marriage, my lifestyle, everything about me. It changes it. And I can do literally, literally Scripture says I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. What a God. What a, what a God. I'm telling you, church, we need to get this mindset. It's not a God in heaven that cannot be touched with our feelings of our infirmities. But he is a God that is ever present. He is in us. He's working through us. He's work, he wants to work through every one of us. Woo. Thank God. But, but this is the deal. This is where we're at. Thank God we have more hope. But I'm telling you, if uh, not everybody in the church has a full understanding of the power, the value of the hope they have. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. In fact, I, I, that's the last thing I want to be. I do not want to be, if you've, you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is an amazing, amazing benefit. What a blessing you have just to be able to, to hold in your hands the word of God. Just to be able to say, oh, I love the word. Let me live it. Just that, 
that man, that is a, that is a God man, by the way. You don't wake up saying, I want to live for God. There's something inside of you that says, I as a person, my will, I want my will to submit to the will of God. I want, I want to have my life aligned with the word of God. And so we, we, that is a God thing. You take God out and you got me before I come to the Lord. <laughs> you get very many of me together and you're going to have more problems than you know what to do with. But, we, but if we dig deeper, if we dig into the word, if we really begin to dig into the word and quit following, I'm going to tell you this, quit following the opinions and the ideas or the traditions of mankind and say, look, that's what the word says. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. John 3 and 3 said, Jesus answered, said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. So we've got to, we can, we can go back and say, what does it mean to be born again? He goes, he does it again. John 3 and 5, two scriptures down. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'm, listen, if you're going to be living for God all this lifespan, the 70, 80 years, whatever you get, then why not do it to a, for a cause? Why not live for an end result that will be better than the, than the life you're living here? That's the reason why some of our elders, they struggled so hard physically in this life. They struggle with every kind of, and the, the health system wasn't what we have today. And the, the legal system isn't what, wasn't what we have today. And, and, and they grew up, I was talking to, I, I won't, anyway, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but, but they, they, the child labor laws didn't exist. They worked and they suffered and they, they had hard times. And, and, and because of those hard times, they rested in the promises of God. I'm, I'm living this life. Just And this hard life, if you will, just so I can live again in a life that is full of blessings and, and honor in heaven. And church, we have got it so good now that sometimes we don't even think about heaven. Oh, God, help us. And I said that on purpose. God, help us. Because if we ever get our eyes so set on the things of this world and forget about the one to come, we will be, we will be of all men most miserable. We will be cast among the goats, if you will. We'll be of those that are shoved off to the side and say, I don't even know you. Because you put your trust in so many other things. The true value, I've got to hurry, the true value is the kingdom, is the kingdom of God. It seems Paul was astounded when he, when he found followers. We, we're back in Acts 19, if you will, just for a few moments. It, when I read this, I'm, I see where he's just dumbfounded. What do you, what do you mean you've not, you've not been born again? What, you, you're not full of spirit. What, 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 do, you, what do you mean? And, and he's doing the math. It's kind of like if we would do, um, what do you mean you don't understand algebra? Well, do you understand? If it, you, oh, you don't understand? If, well, let's go. What about, do you understand, you don't understand multiplication? Let's go. Do you know your pluses and minuses? <laughs> and, and finally, he gets back to this point to where, ah, oh, so we've got a foundation to work with. You believe, you're a follower, you're a student, but you've not been baptized in Jesus' name. That's what he says. Now, some people in the church says, well, what's the difference? The Bible says, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of Jesus. Acts 4 and 12 says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Every time then anybody was baptized in the Bible, they were baptized in Jesus' name. The name of Jesus, in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead, Colossians 2. The fullness of the Godhead is in him, and you are complete in him. We can just go on and on and on. I love, I love uh, one of the things that I, I mean, I'm the only one that ever saw this, but uh, I'm just kidding. 1 Corinthians, where, where Paul is talking about, I hear there's divisions among you. Some of you are saying you're of Apollos and some of Paul. And he looks at them and he asks a rhetorical question. Did they die for you? Oh, they didn't die for you. So that's not the name you put on you. Who died for you? Jesus Christ died for my sins. Whose name am I going to put on me? Jesus Christ. You must be baptized. Some of us are going, well, I, it don't matter. Yes, it does. It's the name above every name. It's the name that every knee will bow. You must be baptized in Jesus' name. Some of you, you're, you're struggling because tradition and, you're, and what you've been taught, it's, it's like, ah, what are you talking about? You're pulling me into an area that I'm not, I'm not fully understanding. That, listen, let me tell you something. In the name of Jesus right now, I pray against every barrier 
that you would hear the truth and you would not just be a hearer only, but a doer as well. Submit yourself not to the, men, to the word of men, but to the word of God. And so Paul was looking at these people, and, and I know I, I feel the spiritual battle going on as we speak. There's people going, let me just keep going. The, the, Paul was astounded. He was confused. He was, it was like, what do you mean? You, you're a follower of Jesus? Yes. And well, then how was you? Bat- let me just read it. Let me read it. He said, he said uh, have you received the Holy Ghost? We don't even know that there is a Holy Ghost. He said, well, then unto the end, what were you? How were you? Excuse me. He said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. That's pretty good. John, disciple of Christ. Forerunner of Christ. He was, he was, I mean, he was a, an amazing man of God. He, you would think that would qualify. That would be good enough. But the, the, Paul clarifies it and said, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. I'm just a forerunner. I'm just the, I'm just the crier in the night. There's somebody coming. There's something coming, like a, like a prophet, if you will, going forth saying, hey, I'm telling you, you better get ready for something's coming. I'm not the man, but I'm, I'm leading, I'm, I'm ahead of the man, if you will, stating that he's coming. And he says, look on him, Jesus Christ, verse 4. Amen. And when they heard this, I love this part because it's very important. Now, when is a, is a critical time in our lives. When? Uh, when? <laughs> I'll go back just in my mind for a few moments. When that man gave me that little booklet, John, the book of John, when I got it, I had a choice to make. When I got it, would I open it or would I put it under my head and maybe osmosis, it would just kind of seep into my head. When I got that book, what would I do with it? When I picked that book up, did I, did I turn it to uh, just random? Hey, let me just, you know, like some of us. Keep silence before me. Oh, am I being quiet from now on? That's what it says. Isaiah 41. <laughs> but, listen, when it matters what you do, when you see the truth, when you hear the truth, when you know this is not what uh, people are telling me, but the word of God is telling me. And when they heard this, what happened? They responded. They were baptized in the name of, G- of the Lord Jesus. Oh, church, hear me today. If you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you have got something to start with. Amen. It's not the end, but it's a very, very, very good beginning. In fact, it's the only beginning. you got to go through Jesus. Woo. And when? I, I can, just put yourself in their shoes for a minute. You're, they're sitting there, hey, Lincoln, shh. <laughs> My grandson, he's like, what, a week and three days old? <laughs> Straighten him up. <laughs> but, but put yourself in, in that picture there, that, that, that image. You're, you're, you're Paul, you're, you're preaching the gospel, you're sharing the truth. By the way, this is, he's, sharing, he's sharing the gospel with them right now. That's what the, this, is the, this is sharing the gospel. It's not, Jesus loves you. Yeah, that's, Jesus loves everybody. He created everybody. He loved Hitler. But Hitler didn't love the Lord. Come on. We got to get mature. We got to wake up. And he, he's walking along. He sees these people. These, these follow, and he discovers, oh, you know, Je- oh, you know about Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? Well, we know that he, he made the bread and he divided it out and he turned water into wine. What, oh, that's awesome. That's just the beginning. Have you, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? Huh? I mean, there, what do you mean? What, I don't understand. What? Holy what? <laughs> we, I think a Casper the ghost, not the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? They're like, oh, no, no Holy Ghost. I've heard of a ghost, but no Holy Ghost. Right? We, if, you're, if you're a foreigner to, the, to Christianity as general, that's what you would think now. If you're a foreigner to the Word of God, you wouldn't think Holy Ghost. You would just think of some creepy dude that shows up in your bedroom and you start throwing stuff at it. I don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. It says, well, then if you don't know what the Holy Ghost is, how were you baptized? And he goes through this thing. And, they, and the Bible says they heard this. They were, number one, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, a man anointed of God, 
full of the Spirit. He prayed. That, that is a, 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 a symbol, if you will, of authority. He laid his hands upon them and prayed for them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says they spake with tongues and prophesied. It doesn't say, we use prophecy as if it's telling some future event. The word means he declaring the goodness of God. They spake in tongues and declared what an amazing Savior you are. If you can't say that today, something's wrong with your Holy Ghost. It's probably not holy. It's just your spirit. But God is good. He's better than me than I can be to myself. He's better to me than my wife can be. He's better than me than anybody else has ever been. I know everybody, there's a lot of people that deserve credit for what I, who I am. But God is good. And above him there is no other. In him I live and move and have my being. Hey, my life runs on the spirit of God. The church is powered by the spirit of God. We're not powered by Bible quizzing. We're not powered by the, by the good singing and oh, they do good. I'm not trying to say all that. But I'm saying those things are just a symbol. That's not where the power is. The power is in the Spirit of God. The, the Holy Spirit within us. But you got to go through the door. you got to be baptized in Jesus' name. Whoa. Oh, I wish I had that picture again. My wife and I were talking about it recently. Um, I've got a picture. It's, it's, it's uh, talking about the door. I'm the door. I'm the, I'm the way. If you don't come through me, anybody that doesn't come through me is a thief. And, and the picture is, the, the picture that Jesus was drawing at that time, a mental image, if you will, was the sheepfold, which is a wall, a parapet of rock to keep animals, uh, predators out. And then there's an opening. And Jesus, the shepherd, Back then, the shepherd, and he's saying, I am the shepherd. Jesus is sitting at the only opening into the sheepfold. Oh, you've got to go through Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other name. There's no other pathway. Any other name is a, is a thief. Anybody else. So I've got to hurry. Paul is spreading the gospel, and he sees this. Amazing scene. People that had believed in Jesus, but they hadn't done anything about it. The day of Pentecost. I'm going to quickly go to that, and then I got to. Uh, I'm, I'm, you won't. You won't miss your dinner. The day of Pentecost is a pretty amazing day. In fact, I want to. I want to say some things that that probably will. I hope it makes you think. It'll probably contradict what some of you believe. And I'm going to be very gentle about it, but I want you to understand what really is going on. The day of Pentecost became the turning point for all of history. Now, uh, society in general will say, oh no, that was the birth of Jesus. The birthday of Jesus was when everything changed. And truly, uh, B.C., A.D., uh, a lot of things did change and we honor the birth of Jesus. Think, think, I'm just say thank God for it. Uh, we, but we make, we make the birth of Jesus... The pivotal, the pivotal, pivotal, or celebratory moment. That's what we, society has made this. And I'm going to say this again. I'm going to say something probably contradict, or not, maybe not contradict, but you're going to, I hope you think about this. Society has made the birth of Jesus the pivotal point. In reality, the scheme is for you to ignore the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The world don't celebrate Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate Christmas. But the church of all things should celebrate the day of Pentecost. When the, hey, the birth of the church, the pouring out of the Spirit of God, that's when everything changed. Because even Satan himself, yes, heaven and hell both trembled knowing that these people do not have to be afraid of death anymore. I have no power over them. Satan is thinking, what am I going to do now? I have no, I, I can't use fear of, of death against them anymore. Church, hear me today. You, I'm telling you, the outpouring of the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost and on our birthday, our spiritual birthday, is the most life-changing event that will ever happen in our history of the world. <laughs> nothing, nothing equates. It changed everything. It changed everything. And when you are spiritually born again 
of the water, being baptized in Jesus' name, and being filled with his spirit, when you are spiritually born again, there is no birthday, anniversary, uh, uh, work anniversary, or anything else that can equate to that day. And today, we celebrate <laughs> the day of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. All oh, these presents that we get for Christmas don't hold a candle and compared to the outpouring of His Spirit. All the gifts that we give and receive and all the days we celebrate, we take the whole month of December. But church, this one day is the day that everything changed for us. And it was... I'm guesstimating, but I believe it was July the 14th of, of 1990, 91, excuse me, July the 14th of 1991, when I had my own personal day of Pentecost. You see, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We can't physically uh, move ourselves back to the day of Pentecost and say, oh, I wish I was there. But God can go forward into history and to all people. The Bible says in all tongues, languages, people, there is no uh, barriers between his work and our, our generation. And he wants, he comes forward into our generation into 1991, and he poured his spirit out in my life. What day did he pour his spirit out in your life? Has he poured his spirit out in your life yet? If you haven't yet, you need to. Today is the best day you've ever had. It's the best day you ever have. The spirit of God seals us. I could go on. Oh my goodness, I could go on and on. The spirit of God is a seal. The Bible says a seal of promise. It, is, it tells me when I'm full of his spirit. And there's evidence of this. The Bible, here in Acts 19, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the, the Holy Ghost came on them and they heard, they spake with tongues. You go back to Acts, sorry, <laughs> you go back to Acts chapter 10, and the Bible says, they, they believed, they were astonished, for they heard them speak with tongues. They magnified God. And then Paul answered, well, hey, why don't you get, go ahead and get baptized in the name of Jesus, the name above every name. Let's do it. That is the evidence the evidence is the submission of a heart that is full of the devil and full of all kinds of stuff. But when we repent of our sins and God washes us out and cleanses us, some of us, I'm, oh dear God, I wish I could get the attention of some, some young people that are struggling, that don't know what their life holds in the future. You give your life to God and you don't have to worry about your future. God will lead you and guide you. He'll plant you. He'll groom you. He'll pour his power in you. You'll become something that nobody would ever think you could become. Stand here as a, a testimony to those things. I was at a wedding yesterday. My nephew got married, and that's where my, a lot of people were there. Anyway, my point is I had several people walk up to me. It was a kind of, it all, when, I go back, when I go back home, it's always kind of this weird, <laughs> they're like, Never would have seen that coming. <laughs> Almost every time I get several people say, wow, look at what God has done. I'm like, yeah. Keith Castleberry couldn't do it. Melissa Castleberry couldn't do it. Galen Walters couldn't do it. My mama couldn't do it. My grandmama couldn't do it. But when the Lord Jesus Christ got a hold of my life, oh, church, hear me today. If you would just let the power of God work in your life. If you would just let go and let God, some of us are so refined, even in Pentecostal churches, we become so refined that we can't even dance and shout. It, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of, listen to me, it's not the Spirit of God in a building, it's the Spirit of God in a man, and a woman. Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. You wonder, you look around, well, man, why are they shouting? Why are they dancing? Why are they acting like, because they've got liberty. Oh, God. Am I concerned? Yes, I'm concerned. Concerned that the Pentecostal church don't remain Pentecostal. It bothers me. It should bother you. It should bother you if you say, well, I'm going to a Pentecostal church, but I'm not Pentecostal anymore. Holy Spirit. Okay, let me move on. So quickly, I'm going to close. We'll get out of here shortly. Oh, no, I'm just playing. I'm just... Okay, so in 2001, and I have... <laughs> I have proof of this. I'm going to move on. So uh, I have proof of this, and it's weird. I have struggled for years to prove this, but I do have proof, and I'll, sh I'll share it with you in a minute. So in 2001, my wife and I come to College Station, just randomly come through town. God called us back. 
we went to Stanmar. I told you that story a few weeks ago. And uh, a few weeks later, right before we moved here, third trip, I believe it was. It might have been the second trip, third trip. We come here and we said, let's go to George Bush Library. And um, we walked in. If you've ever been to George Bush Library, the rotunda is as big as this church, maybe bigger. And um, <clears throat> on the far side back there, kind of where the sound booth is, we, we walk in, we're looking around. And this is, I feel like I'm telling an amazing story right now. And maybe you need to hear it like that. I walk in and I look back there and there is this big plexiglass case about probably about that wide about that tall and it's sitting on an angle about like that and there's people there I mean just lots of people just it's almost covered up and there's you can see two guards back there keeping people from doing any damage to what's inside the case and so I walk up to it and uh, there's this book and it's opened up I think they would call it I'm trying to remember the the legal um, they anyway a quattro not a quattro the yeah, quattro, I think it is, where it's the book is about opened up is about that wide and it's about that tall, about 18 inches tall and about almost three feet wide. And uh, it, it's obvious that it's it's interesting and it's obvious that it's precious. And I walk up to it and all I see is just obviously signatures, just tons. I mean, hundreds of signatures on those two pages alone. I mean, not hundreds, but a hundred signatures on those two pages. And I'm looking and they have little arrows pointing to different people that had signed this book. And there was in that book signatures from Adolf Hitler, um, uh, Einstein, um, Chamberlain that, that went over. I mean, hundreds of prominent, uh, what do they call them today? Um, influencers. <laughs> they call them influencers today. Hundreds of these signatures in this book. And I'm, and I'm standing, of course, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a history buff like Brother Garrett, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a history buff junior. Yeah, he's a 2.0. I'm a, like a 0.1. So I, I looked at this book and I'm like, man, that is crazy. That is so cool. So the story is this brass book, this brass bound book set on Jim Jensen's coffee table for 55 years. He was in an infantry, 5th Corps, in the Army, during World War II, Leipzig, Germany, Germany, goes in, finds this book, puts it in a big crate, ships it to the U.S. His mom and dad put it in their garage. He comes home from being in the military, opens it up, puts it on a shelf, and forgets about it. And he never messed with it. He couldn't get into it because it was locked. There was big hasp, long hasp that covered all sides of this book, and it locked. And he couldn't unlock it, and he knew that it was precious, so he didn't want to damage the locks. And so he just set it there. And for 55 years, this book sat on the shelf until somebody that was a little educated come along, somebody a little bit more knowledgeable. And they walked in the door, and they saw this book, and they're like, dude, this is not normal. <laughs> this is extraordinary, as Toby Mac says. <laughs> I love Toby Mac. This is extraordinary. What have you got here? And, there, and the, Jim Jensen is like, ah, you know, just I've had it for a few years. You need to have somebody look at this and examine it and let us know what it's worth. And so he took it up to the history, uh, the history department up at Texas A&M. Unfortunately for Jim Jensen, they called the city of Leipzig, Germany. And they said, that's our book. We want it back now. <laughs> Come to find out it wasn't brass. It was solid gold. The, the, the binding was solid gold. The five hasps that went across the top of it were solid gold. The backing of it was solid gold. And with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signatures inside of it, they said, there is no value we can put on that book. And we want it back. Jim Jensen gave it to A&M. A&M, because of the diplomacy at the time, sent it to the Smithsonian. They recorded a bunch of stuff. They sent it to Leipzig, Germany. Leipzig, Germany, Germany because it's illegal over there, they put it in a lead box, buried it in a, in a cave to never be seen again. Such a precious treasure sitting on a shelf for 55 years. I wonder how many here today have something so much more valuable available. It's sitting there. It's ready for you. All you got to do is pick it up and look into it. All you have to do is say, I want that. 
That's, that's for me. That's mine. I want our musicians to come. And I want us all to stand, if you will, for a few moments. That, that there is, they're literally the, the, the appraisers, the historians. And I, like I said, I've got proof of this. I've got the press releases, all I could find so far. I'm going to get pictures one day if I have to go steal them from the Smithsonian. But they, the, the historians said there is no value we can put on that book. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> there is no value you can put on the Spirit of God. Oh, there is, there is just so much. I'm, this word is more precious than every book in the, in the entire world. You can fill libraries up with books and it wouldn't equate to what's in here. And above this, oh, it's the Spirit of God. Spirit of God. The earnest of our inheritance. Brother Jackson, whoo, it's, it's, he puts it in us. He says, let me tell you, I want to give you, this is, the, let, me, let me explain that term. This is in the Bible. It says, this is the earnest of our inheritance. If you go to, the, if you go to town and you, you want to buy a house, if you don't have all the money, you put what they call a down payment. A down payment. The, the, in, in old terms, it's earnest money. You, I'm serious about buying this house. I'm very serious. I know it costs, let's just make up a number. Let's, in today's world, it's a million dollars. And I only have $10. Well, if you'll put that $10 down, that tells us that you're serious about buying this house. The Bible says that the Spirit of God in this world, in our lives, is just a down payment. It's just a starter. It's just something. And what I have found, <laughs> he's made more payments to me. Hmm. Every time, every time I get in a bind, the Spirit of God steps in and says, I'll make a payment for you. <laughs> every time I have a problem, and make a payment on you. And I'm just I want to remind you, this is just a taste of what you're going to get in heaven. Oh, church, let me tell you something. If you're not filled with the Spirit today, you're missing out. The value, oh, if you would just dig a little deeper, if you would just get into the Word, if you just just prove, prove in fact, I would go back to some of those, those media things that they're doing. Prove me wrong. Show me where somebody was baptized in any other name. Show me where anybody gets into heaven, into the kingdom of heaven, without being born again. Show me. It's not in there. <laughs> Whoa. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's what the song says. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, the Scripture says, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I want us all to come right now. And I'm, not, I'm saying all, I'm not trying to intimidate anybody, hurt anybody's feelings. But if you just come, we're not going to bite you. Just come up here. And we're going to start worshiping the Lord. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to begin to renew that spirit. I, no fakes, no shows. We're not looking for a show. We're looking for somebody to say, Lord, here I am. Take my life. Take all that is within me. I'm humble before you. I need you and you alone. I need you more than I need anything else. Come on, somebody. You're waiting on somebody to do something for you. Begin to worship. Begin to talk to the Lord. Lord, I need you above everything else. You've got to have a want to. It's when, now, it's when, now, it's when, now, now, now. What are you going to do with it? In the name of Jesus, I worship you. I honor you and I praise you. You, Lord God, I desire you more than I desire anything else. Come on, somebody, tell him. Lord, I want you. I want renewal. Come on, I see people crying out right now. That's it. Keep crying out. In the name of Jesus, we're going to go through and lay hands on you in a minute. I'm expecting the Lord to lay his own power on you. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, don't be so prideful. Don't be so haughty. You need the power. Lift your hands and begin to cry out. I need you, Lord Jesus. I need you, Lord Jesus. I need your spirit in me. I need a renewing in my life. I need you, Lord God.